Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Alexander Rosenthal again. Uh, I'm here with um, co-founder Miles Smith. You would, would you like to, Dr. Miles Smith? Would you like to introduce yourself again? Hello, everybody. Good to have you back. Last week we uh, talked about. Um, an introduction to the idea of classical education, how it might differ from modern education, and the idea of paideia. That led us to a kind of intimation of the idea of classics for everyone. Uh, on that theme, Alex, uh, did you want to tell us, uh, tell the audience a bit about uh, courses that we have that are accessible at bringing classics to everyone? Yeah, I mean, I guess the first thing that I should say is that uh, the whole idea of this, uh, you know, in, in starting this is how do we bring sort of the treasures of Western civilization, uh, something which has guided uh, human achievement for centuries, how do we bring it to just um, uh, the general public, uh, you know, um, with experts in the fields, um, in these courses, uh, you know, providing first-rate educations at uh, what I think are incredibly affordable uh, prices. So um, we're, the first course we'll be doing is on um, Classical philosophy and the virtues. The next one is, and its next uh, course will be starting in October, and uh, we're going to have a little video on that. And I should also just let everyone know if you're interested, uh, www.petrarch-institute.com. Uh, you can find all the information on our courses. Very good. Now, Alex, last week we uh, started off by talking about this idea of the classical education uh, as the way of making a person better, uh, making a person complete, as it were, to, to their intended nature. Um, we also talked about this idea, as you mentioned, that on the one hand, the classics are with us today. On the other hand, uh, they draw on people who lived a long time ago. So in terms of the, these kind of sources or pillars of, of modern civilization, the modern world as we know it, uh, there's a kind of stylized uh, duality that people sometimes talk about. On the one hand, Athens. On the other hand, Jerusalem. Did you want to tell the audience a little bit about that dichotomy? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the very interesting things about Western civilization is that it has uh, minimally a dual inheritance, right? So on the one hand, what we talked about last time, we, we had a special focus on Athens, right? These traditions of rational inquiry, uh, which underlie Western philosophy, Western science and mathematics. Uh, and we could talk also about uh, the role of Greek culture in arts and letters and aesthetic values, right? But Western culture also has another pole, uh, Jerusalem, right? Ancient Israel, the Bible, right? Uh, and uh, the, these two uh, cultures developed for many, many centuries. Of course, ancient Israel is older, but it developed uh, largely separate from each other. And, and there's, uh, you know, until their encounter. And there's a whole other set of ideas uh, in the biblical uh, worldview, uh, focused on notions of monotheism, of revelation, of faith, of prophecy, right? You can even think of the supernatural, right? The miraculous and so forth. Uh, so so um, there's sort of a whole different worldview that was developing there. And Western civilization has historically been a kind of convergence, right, between these two traditions of biblical faith on the one hand, and classical Greco-Roman culture, on the other hand. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things is, uh, on the one hand, there seems to be a dynamic tension between these two. In some ways, Western culture has kind of oscillated. Uh, but you could think, for example, of the Renaissance was a time when the Greek and Roman cultures were very strongly uh, emphasized. And then there was kind of the reaction of the Reformation, which strongly emphasized the biblical uh, heritage, right? So this sort of oscillation between Judeo-Christian, two hyphens, Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian, uh, have really been pivotal sources for Western culture. And we can't really understand our modern world at all in any way uh, without understanding uh, these two fonts uh, of, our, of, 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 the, of the civilization. In the, in the past, Alex, you've made the point that um, there's a bit of a synthesizing crucible for these two streams in Rome. And you've also pointed out that uh, although they have different um, cardinal points, you talked about prophecy and revelation on the one hand, 
uh, reason, perhaps metaphysics on the other, they have a kind of affinity or common blood on the topic of human dignity. Did you want to tell us yeah. a little bit about that and the, the, how they basically came together? Uh, sure. Uh, well, let, let me just talk, say something about human dignity and then uh, then I can get into a little bit of the, the historical overview, right? So, on the one hand, we talked last time about this whole idea of paideia or humanitas, right? The whole idea of a form of education which would develop the various potencies of human nature, uh, moral, physical, intellectual, uh, aesthetic, right, or sense of beauty and so forth, uh, develop all these into the ideal, right? And so this is sort of an ideal of human dignity, but an ideal of human dignity, uh, one could say, that uh, needs to be developed, right? We, we um, as Sadaletto said, we receive our nature in a rough form, right? And it's the function of letters to um, make man conform to the divine original, right? <laughs> right, so it's this idea of developing man to the, to the ideal. In the case of the Greco-Roman tradition, uh, sorry, of the uh, biblical tradition, right, right in the opening of Genesis, right, man is called, talked about as being in the image of God, right? So it is a dignity which is uh, conferred uh, by the Creator, right? And this is very fundamental, right? I mean, you could even think of the words of the Declaration of Independence, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? The equal dignity of human beings. Um, and of course, there are other ideas. Uh, the uh, uh, there are other ideas in the Bible which also emphasize dig uh, human dignity. And in the course of the Renaissance, particularly, these two streams came together very powerfully. Uh, so you could think of Pico della Mirandola's statement about how uh, God created man uniquely, of uh, you know, with with this freedom, right? by which he can develop himself into that which he wishes, whether for good or for ill, <laughs> right? But this sort of, I think, kind of bring, bridges the gap in a sense of, right, so on the one hand you have the prospect of developing yourself, right? Uh, but on the other hand, it, you're able to do that because of something innate in, you, uh, in the way we were created, right? So I think that that's kind of an interesting idea. And did you want to tell us a little bit about the sort of unique environment of Rome and how that's a sort of a turning point or a cardinal reference point for these two streams. Sure, um, but let me just backtrack just a little bit to just talk about the very beginning of the interaction between Athens and Jerusalem, right, which is a little earlier than Rome, which is um, the first real historical interaction we have is uh, during the time of, the, uh, between, let's say, Greece and Israel, right? would be in the time of Alexander the Great, right? So Alexander the Great essentially conquers the entire uh, Middle East, right, beginning about 335 BC, uh, and the project really is one of Hellenization, right, spreading Greek culture uh, throughout the entire Middle East, and this is really the first historical encounter between ancient Greece and Israel. And you have, um, I would say from the beginning a kind of attraction repulsion thing going on between these two cultures, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, on the one hand you have uh, some some Jews, particularly in Alexandria, in, in the Ptolemaic area, who um, become essentially Hellenized, right? And you could think of things like the first translation of the Bible into Greek, the Septuagint, right? Figures like Philo Eudeus, right? But on the other hand, particularly in Jerusalem, right? Uh, there is this uh, fear, right, after all, one of the strongest things in Israel is the idea of there being one God, right, uh, and uh, the idea of, um, uh, of uh, maintaining a, a Jewish identity, which Hellenization is kind of threatening, uh, and r when the uh, king Antiochus uh, rather uh, foolishly decided to put a statue of Zeus in the Jewish temple, this touched off the great Maccabean. Uh, revolt, right? <laughs> so Athens and Jerusalem uh, didn't always get off on the right foot, but <laughs> but uh, in the fullness of time, um, uh, you know there was uh, you know uh, the the um, the two streams uh, really mixed, and I guess now I could talk a little bit about uh, Rome and the rise of Christianity. Yeah. Okay. What? No, that that'd be great. Okay. Uh, okay. So, I mean, 
uh, so starting starting in the so the Roman Empire basically uh, co conquers you know sort of the political uh, institution that uh, basically conquers both the the whole Mediterranean world right uh, and it's sort of the locus of the synthesis between Athens and Jerusalem which is why some people especially Ramin Brock also like to bring in Rome as the third city uh, but um, I'd say so the classic encounter in the New Testament would be St. Paul at the Areopagus, right? So uh, he gives a speech at the Areopagus, which is like the Greek Supreme Court. I mean, the spot where the Greek Supreme Court would met. Uh, and he basically sees an altar to an unknown god, and he says to the Athenians, he says basically that the one who you worship as unknown, this uh, as the unknown god, right, this I proclaim to you, right? Uh, so it's the idea that in some way the Greeks have also been waiting or expecting uh, 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 Christianity, right? So, so uh, from the, so basically we can think of Christianity as this movement which begins in Israel but spreads and wins its converts primarily from the Greco-Roman world. Now, in the early development of the church, we see the same duality, right? So you could think of on the one hand Tertullian. Right? Tertullian is the one who, who has this phrase, Athens and Jerusalem. He says, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, the church with the academy, right? So this kind of, uh, on the one hand, the, 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 you, you know, you have the same uh, uh, concern about pagan culture, right? And also sort of, we could think of sort of the pride uh, that was, I mean, Christianity initially won many of its converts not from the highly educated, but from very ordinary folks, right? So the pride of Athenian learning and the danger of vain curiosity that Christians would be somehow led astray. But on the other hand, you have in Alexandria again, which is this major place in Ghana, you have Clement of Alexandria carrying on this Pauline theme of uh, you know, basically, he says that just as the prophets prepared the way for Christianity, this is the Christian view, right? That the prophets of the Old Testament prepared the way for Christianity. Greek philosophy did the same thing for the Greeks, right? Uh, that uh, God was somehow active. And I guess another thing I could just uh, talk about is maybe uh, what was the use which the early Christians, because I think Clement's view was really the much more dominant view, the view that became much more dominant in the early church, why they thought learning from these pagan cultures of Greece and Rome, why, why, the, why it was still important for a Christian. Does that make, make sense? So, um, so I, I think the three things is one, preparatory. Many of the ideas that you see in Greek philosophy, right? The immortality of the soul, reward for the good and punishment for the wicked, right? Um, the existence of a god, of a supreme being and principle, right? All of these things find a place in Greek philosophy and especially in the greatest Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Plato. And a number of church fathers, St. Augustine and uh, 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 St. Justin Martyr, right, talk about how they were led to Christianity first through the study of Greek and Roman thinkers, right? So that's one thing, is preparatory. Another thing is apologetics, right? So as Christianity comes under attack uh, from uh, in, uh, 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 intellectuals, right, Greek and Roman intellectuals, they had to be cultured just in order to respond to these attacks, right? Uh, and to put the lie to the claim made by, by a lot of pagan thinkers that Christianity was basically an uncultured form uh, of, of, uh, of religion. But the third thing, which becomes especially important after Rome itself converts to Christianity, after Constantine, and you start having church councils uh, defining doctrine, is that the concepts of Greek philosophy become absorbed into Christian theology, right? Uh, they become the tools that are used to describe these various doctrines like the Trinity and so on, right? Really the word theology predate, you know, is originally Greek. It's in Plato and Aristotle, right? Uh, the concept of rational reflection on God. And, and in formulating all these concepts, the Trinity, right? You, they talk about one essence, three persons, usia, 
right? They talk about Christ's natures, right? What is a nature? There are philosophical claims, uh, issues raised by the very things which we find in the Bible, and they're using the categories of, of Greek philosophy to, uh, to define them. Uh, so by the end of the, by the late Roman Empire, there was a deep uh, mixing of it, although I should just uh, say uh, what one of the, uh, uh, you have, uh, there, there was always a, f a feeling of danger that Christians would get too absorbed in, in pagan learning. You see, especially in Jerome, you have the famous dream where he has a vision of Jesus who chides him. He says, you are not a Christian, you are a Caesarodian, right? And you have uh, one of the things that I find funny, uh, in a way, is uh, he, he talks about, um, uh, he said he talks about all the pagan learning he's absorbed in his schooling, Jerome, and he says, um, "Now I need to go to the River Leth, <laughs> you know, to put away this pagan learning." But the River Leth is, of course, itself a part of Greek mythology, which just goes to show the difficulty, uh, even for those who wanted to put some distance right there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting story. Well, that's a very uh, rich offering in the history of ideas, Alex. I think the audience can sort through that uh, on multiple replays. But um, at the high level, uh, three things that I think a lot of people will be hearing there are um, overlays or convergences between the Athenian tradition and the Jerusalem tradition uh, on the topic of human dignity, on the one hand, uh, yeah. on the issue of accountability to the good, you know, that we... we we will be judged for our actions or we are accountable to high standards, to a high potential of what a person can be uh, in the second instance or the second hand. And on the third hand, if there's a third hand, uh, this idea that everyone deserves an answer. You know, so the ability to challenge either by reason or uh, on, on the grounds of human worth or the equality of people under God. So there, there's some interesting um, reasons why these traditions would be brought together. For a lot of modern people, it's often thought that reason and revelation are one the antithesis of the other. So is there anything to that? Is there anything we can say drawing on the history and the sort of rich uh, background of, of thematics of ideas that would validate that? Or is that, uh, or is that just an, an overstated view? Yeah, well, of course, that's the big question, right? Uh, but um, I think, uh, uh, first of all, we have to think of reason and revelation as two distinct, at, at the very least, two distinct ways of approaching reality, right? So think about just the idea of God, right? The idea of a supreme being, which is important both in Greek philosophy and in the Bible, of course, right? Uh, but you have in, in the Bible, uh, sorry, in, in Greek philosophy, uh, it's essentially a conclusion of rational argument. Think about Aristotle argues uh, to a first mover. Right in his physics and metaphysics, right from seeing the motion of nature, he concludes there can't be an in infinite series, and therefore there has to be a first mover. So it's a kind of rational conclusion from the facts that one sees in nature. Right uh, in the Bible, uh, God, uh, the, the the question does God exist is not really one that comes up very much. Right, it, it opens in the beginning. God created the heaven and earth, and God kind of reveals Himself. Uh, through these mighty acts and wonders, right, and uh, prophets and so forth. Uh, and so the question that has always uh, dogged Western thinkers is, is the God of the philosophers the same as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Uh, so I would say uh, in Aquinas, in Th St. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, right, who was really a response to the Second reception of Athens, we could say, when the translation of Aristotle after long, after most of his works were lost for much of the early part of, part of the Middle Ages, and there's this confrontation uh, between reason and revelation, and some are very worried. Right? Are people going to, um, are people going to, uh, uh, you know, judge the Bible according to their own lights of reason? This sort of, is this going to threaten the foundations of the faith? Well, he basically argues, look, God has given human beings two lights, the natural light of reason and the supernatural light of faith, right? Uh, so on the one hand, there is what God has revealed, which transcends nature, the supernatural light of faith, and what human beings, what God has given to human beings to understand uh, through their own uh, a gift, as it were, of reason, right? Reason is a gift of God, and there can't be any ultimate contradiction between them. 
So this is really the argument for synthesis, and I think it's been very powerful. Uh, but this is not to say, I mean, you think of uh, Pascal, right? Pascal says, I want the God of Abraham. I don't want the God <laughs> of the philosophers, right? So the ver this very question of uh, their assimilation has been one of the tensions, uh, has been one of the central issues of uh, Western civilization. But, uh, but, but ultimately, I find the points of commonality, you know, if you think about the existence of God, the belief in the virtues, like right? what is a good life, um, the natural, you know, the, the 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 symmetry between the natural ethics of Aristotle and much in biblical ethics. Uh, I think that there are good arguments to say that um, you know these are both streams that enrich us rather than be mutually exclusive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Alex, uh, I think we've taken people on a whirlwind tour of a number of issues that have preoccupied great minds for centuries. So it's a, it's a good day's work for, for us and for our audience. Um, there are a number of topics there that we look forward to unpacking in the future. So we, I think we'll be revisiting and developing some of these things in detail for people who are interested. And those who want to join uh, the conversation on similar topics can also find us on Twitter, where we are known as Petrarch Center. C E N T R E in the uh, English world styling. Very uh, good to be with you, everyone, and uh, I'm sure I will see you again, as it were. Take care. Forward to seeing you next time.